Now, after these mythological sorts of stories about the beginning of the cosmos, there began to be philosophical accounts, which are slightly different. Plato, for example, told a story about the structure of the material world that also begins in chaos. And a demiurge came and tried to put that chaos into the most beautiful and uh, appealing form that could be made. Looking at the form of the good as a model. Now, the form of the good for Plato exists outside of time altogether and is unchanging. So the demiurge tried to make in this changing and temporal world a model of the unchanging and eternal. And the best he could do is to think that this stuff had to be in motion, but the most unchanging motion is uniform circular motion. So he took the sphere of fixed stars and set it rotating at a constant rate. And the other planets then also were put on rotating spheres, spheres inside spheres, spheres attached to other spheres to account for the cyclical but uneven motion of the planets relative to the background of fixed stars. Aristotle, following Plato, took up the same theory. It's a theory of homocentric spheres of having the earth at the center, the earth is a sphere at the center, and the planets attached to crystalline spheres that are rotating around the earth. Uh, he had a series of 52 different spheres rotating at different rates that came about from observations of the planets and trying to understand how you could predict exactly the courses that the planets would take. But for Aristotle, this seemed to go on forever backward in time, that the universe always had this structure, and it hasn't been changing. And we could call that a steady state cosmology. The idea that uniform circular motion is the most perfect kind of motion, and therefore the motion that the planets should engage in, was carried over into the astronomical theory of Ptolemy. Ptolemy picked up this idea that the perfect kind of motion, the only kind of motion that is appropriate for the heavens is uniform circular motion because it's an unchanging motion. It's always exactly the same. But instead of having, as Plato and Aristotle did, these spheres that were centered on the earth and rotating around the earth, he had circles. Uh, each planet would be carried on a larger circle called a deferent and attached to the deferent were smaller circles called epicycles and the planet would be attached to the epicycle. So as the deferent rotated and the epicycle rotated on the deferent, the planet would be carried around, even sometimes going forward and sometimes backward. And he adjusted the sizes of these circles and their rates of rotation to uh, account for the observed phenomena, to account for what astronomers saw when they looked at the heavens. And for over a thousand years, the Ptolemaic system prevailed as the account of, of the astronomical structure of the world. And astronomers put time into refining their observations and their calculations and adjusting all of these parameters to get better fits to what you can see. However, two events happened that caused a great change. The first event was theoretical. And that it came about because Copernicus suggested that instead of the Earth being stationary with the sphere of fixed stars rotating about it once a day and the planets also being carried around in their orbits, that it was the Earth that was spinning once a day on its axis and that Earth was being carried every year around the sun. So you had a heliocentric system, a sun-centered system, and the Earth instead of being special and being the center of everything, became just one of many planets that were orbiting the sun at different rates. Now this displaced the Earth from its position at the center of the universe, whether you think of that position as being uh, exalted or being the worst <laughs> place that you could be in the universe. Uh, in, in, this, in the other stories, the, the Earth was always the center of things. Now it looked like the Earth wasn't such a special place after all. The other thing that happened theoretically was that in order for Copernicus to make sense of what 
you could see he had to make the sphere of fixed stars much, much, much larger than it was in the Ptolemaic system. Really incredibly, uh, uncomprehensibly large for the people at the time. The second thing that happened was the discovery and use of the telescope for astronomical purposes, chiefly by Galileo. And Galileo looked at the planets and found indisputable evidence that Copernicus was right and Ptolemy was wrong. And he also looked at the stars and found that they seem to be extremely far away in the sense that the planets, when you look at them through the telescope, get enlarged, you see them better, but the stars that appear as points of light don't get enlarged. They still appear as points of light. And Galileo could look at the Milky Way galaxy and see that it was composed of millions and millions of stars. So all of a sudden, from being the center of the universe, First of all, the Earth becomes merely one of many planets orbiting the Sun, but the Sun becomes one of millions and millions of stars. And it no longer seems that we're so special, that, that what's happening around here plays a privileged role in the understanding of the universe. So that starts to bring this scientific cosmology into conflict with religious cosmology. That's why Galileo got in trouble with the Catholic Church. It's hard to think that God created all, everything for us if we are just on a medium-sized planet, uh, one of many in a system that has billions and billions of stars with their own planets and so on.